Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on First and Second Peter. These are the lessons from, for April through June of 2017, and they're entitled, Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. This particular lesson is lesson number 13 in that series, entitled Major Themes in First and Second Peter, and it's a lesson for June 24 of 2017. As you might suspect, trying to touch most of the major teachings of these two letters from Peter is a major challenge, so I hope you have your Bible handy. We'll see what we can do. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have now been studying these, these couple of letters from Peter for some time. Help us as we seek to try to draw some conclusions to what we have learned and, and to sort of summarize what we have learned in this brief time together. May your Holy Spirit guide and touch all hearts who are listening that we may all learn better as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we suggested, we're coming to the end of our study of First and Second Peter. Peter takes some very practical approaches to dealing with major problems that his readers, his first century readers, faced at that point in time. One of the problems he talks about quite a lot in First Peter is the, I don't know whether it would be correct to call it the sporadic uh, problems they had of persecution in those days. Remember that Nero was the uh, emperor at that point in time and tried to accuse the Christians of destroying, the, uh, burning down the city of Rome when in fact he was the one who did it himself. And then the challenge of false teachers arising within the church, which seems to be a major theme of Second Peter. So Peter feels like our theological understanding makes us appropriate, makes it possible for us to speak appropriately about the practical issues also. Um, he goes on to talk about the final judgment of the wicked and the final reward of the righteous, which we know will take place at the third coming of Jesus after the millennium. But we have to recognize that there is no evidence that Peter ever knew anything about a millennium or about a third coming of Jesus. The only disciple that gives any evidence that they knew anything about a millennium and about a third coming is the Apostle John, who lived well into the 90s AD and mentions the third coming in the, in the millennium only in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. So Peter's talking about something that was going to happen at a time he didn't even know about. Interesting. Well, our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has chosen five major themes that they think are the most important themes in these two short letters. One, the suffering of Jesus that led to our salvation. What all is implied by that? Two, our practical response to the knowledge that God will judge our actions at the last judgment. Three, the hope we have in the soon return of Jesus. And finally, <coughs> and four, order in society and in the church. And five, the role of scripture ha Scripture has in providing guidance in our lives. Now those are pretty big issues, and we won't begin to really cover those because those are issues that are found in so many parts of the Bible, and we could bring in stuff from all over the place. Um, Peter starts out by telling his, his, his listeners or his readers, you have been chosen by God to be saved. Now he recognizes that few of his re readers and probably none of the ones he was writing directly to had ever met Jesus or ever seen him, but they trusted the words from the Old Testament they trusted the words from the New Testament, which was in the process of being written at that point in time. And on the basis of that, he felt that they had been set free from their worthless lives that they had been, their, they had been living formerly. Well, then he, he, he dives in. He says, after living a perfect life, Christ, quote, carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
Christ did this to lead us back to God to be partakers of the divine image. Now, I'm going to, the first question I'm going to pose to you, which we're going to probably touch on throughout this lesson, how does his carrying our sins in his body deal with it, making it possible for us to be partakers of the divine image? Are those things related or unrelated? Are those two different things? Or even before that, how can Christ carry our sins in his yeah, body? How, how does that work? It, did he carry our sins all through his life, or he carried them only at the point where he was dying on the Calvary? Uh, did he carry them when he was in, he was in Gethsemane? Um, well, and, I'm not sure that that you know our sins can be taken and put over here, and then we don't have them. I think it's uh, that we come with the, our sins, mm -hmm. and he associates himself with us, and. Because, as Rome, uh, Romans 6 says, uh, we died with him and we're raised with him. So, the, our presence there brings those sins, uh, not separate from us. I think it's there yeah. together. Well, of course, the major Old Testament reference that everybody wants to talk about um, when we come to this issue is found in Isaiah 53. Uh, and they, our Bible study guide suggests we start with verse five, but I think we'd do much better to actually start with verse four. And let me just read it from Isaiah 53. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours. So that's pretty clear. His suffering is the suffering that we should have experienced. The pain that we should have borne, that's still pretty clear. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Now, when it says we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God, what is implied by that we thought that, that his wasn't. suffering was punishment sent by God? That it wasn't sent by God. <laughs> okay. That that's, seems to be what's implied, isn't it? That it wasn't sent by God? Or at least it wasn't punishment. Okay. And he goes on, but because of our sins, he was wounded beaten because of the evil we did, we are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I'm sorry. My computer gave up on me there a second. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way, but the Lord made the punishment fall on him with the punishment all of us deserved. Now, the question there is a tricky one. Are we talking about the general punishment for sin, singular, that involves all of us because we're all sinners, and that fell upon Christ, or is it talking about our individual sins that were somehow taken from us and piled on Jesus, so he's now carrying this huge load of sins, plural. What do you think? Well, why couldn't it be kind of like a reflection of our sins instead of actually being sins? Okay. There's some sort okay. of reflection that was happening oh. so we could see what's going on somehow. Okay, so his actions. In, in general, then, the idea of sin is being dealt with. Is that what you're trying to say? The idea, maybe, tr yeah. The idea, some sort of identification is happening mm -hmm. right then. Peter, reflecting on those verses, says this. He committed no sin, and no one ever heard a lie come from his lips. Of course, that's talking about Jesus. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Christ himself, and here's the words, carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. It is by his wounds that you have been healed. And that's Peter's not exact you know, When you copy. talk about like dying to sin, it's almost like a switch over. Because you're not dying. When you, when you, go, when you die from sin, you're switching over to life. So in a way that if a person is dying or, or in sin, he has to die from it to, to switch over to the life. 
And the same thing that happens when, when good people go to sin, they die, they go back to sin. It's almost like a switchover. I see. Well, let's look at some things which we do understand, somewhat anyway. In the times of the Old Testament, people took a lamb as a sin offering to the courtyard of the tabernacle and later, of course, to the temple at Jerusalem. They confessed their sins on the head of the lamb and then the lamb was sacrificed and the blood of the lamb was symbolically, car symbolically carried their sins, which were then placed on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and at its base. Now, it's interesting that about um, 30 years, 40 years after Jesus had died and was gone back to heaven already, uh, someone came and decided that they wanted to make some kind of a report on what was going on at Passover in Jerusalem. They estimated that there were 2 million people in Jerusalem for that Passover. And they said at that point that the, the priests, and I, I assume the priests must have been the ones who made this decision, that so many people wanted to come and offer lambs, it just wasn't possible to deal with that many lambs. So they said 10 people would have to come and lay their hands on one lamb, and then that one lamb would be sacrificed. Does that... Is it possible to put 10 people's sins on one lamb? Where do we well, get the idea that you can move sins around? Like a, I'm, I'm, like well, a shell asking. game or something like that? It's, it's, it's showing well, that, that this is just a demonstration. Yeah. It's, just, it's just something that, that you're learning from okay. looking at, at what's happening here. I don't think it's actually, things are actually happening. What, what, do you, what do you think that the Israelites living at the time at the foot of Mount Sinai when they did that, the, maybe the first time, what did they think was happening? Well, it depends how much, how dumb you think they are. Or how much know. Moses explained to them. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. Moses and Aaron. Yeah. Hopefully Moses. And how, how educated they were before when Moses started talking to them, for that matter. Well, I think, uh, I, I think as I... I don't know if I said it here or when, before we started, but I don't think sin is transferred like like this is there. Now I don't have it, and he does. I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's by association. God associates himself with us, uh, and so that sort of muddies his throne mm -hmm. uh, because we are, we are sinners, much the same way as somebody going overseas does atro atrocities. That's an American citizen would reflect on our country. Uh, so, uh, because he he he's uh, he died for all of us, uh, all of those he has associated himself with us. With us, okay. You know, it's like the Jews accused him. He eats and drinks with sinners. Mm -hmm. That is a bad thing because. They're, they're I think it's a good thing. <laughs> well, it's good for us because we identify with those sinners. But, you know, uh, it raises the question, why is this person, why is God, how is he going to save these people who are sinners? You know, how can he be just and the justifier of, mm -hmm. of those who uh, come to him? Uh, so if uh, th that's how I see it anyway. Well, it's interesting to carry on in the Old Testament thing, just to cover over that briefly. Leviticus 16 talks about the Day of Atonement. And in effect, if, if you believe the symbolism, your sins, when you go and place your hands on the lamb and so forth, and then the lamb is sacrificed and the blood carries the sins into, into, onto the altar, and then the high priest picks up the sins from the altar and carries them into the temple, into, I mean, into the tabernacle, and then on the Day of Atonement, he goes through an elaborate process whereby he carries them now out of the tabernacle, the sins from the whole year, and he places them on the head of that scapegoat, and the scapegoat is taken by somebody way off into the wilderness where it can never find its way back. And you, it's pretty, pretty easy to see how, for someone who's thinking very concrete terms, okay, there went my sins, there went my sins, and now they're on this goat here, and now the goat is taken off there, so my sins are gone now. You know, it's we that's, that think in concrete terms. Mm -hmm. We're kind of transferring our tendencies onto them. How do you know that they think in such concrete terms? 
Maybe they are understanding uh, something else is happening besides what is actually being done mm -hmm. there. I mean, right now, yeah. scientific people, they are concrete people. Mm -hmm. We live in a scientific world. Yeah. Back then... Our, our Bible study guide says sins were accumulating at the base of the altar. Is that... How do we understand that? It's another concrete term. Well, just, just as I explained, at least the way I look at it, you know, the fact that we continue to be sinners, uh, mm -hmm. that, they, that continues to reflect on his association with us. Uh, how can he continue to put up with us? How's this going to play out? Mm -hmm. And so that's what the Day of Atonement is about, is clearing up all of these uncertainties and how okay. God is indeed going to uh, be just and the justifier of uh, those of us who okay. have accepted and put our trust in Him. I mean, in, 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 in days of Moses, it was very clear. If you didn't participate and you didn't honestly believe what was going on, you were thrown out of the camp. Well, here's a challenging question that I think we all need to deal with in our own minds. The idea that Jesus died for our sins has been a most precious teaching to Christians down through the ages. Various views have been espoused regarding how this actually works. The Roman Catholic Church, and I'm not trying to throw dispersions on any group, but just historically this is a fact, the Roman Catholic Church has taught that by paying a fee called an indulgence, one could buy forgiveness for a sin even before one actually committed that sin. Now, of course, this is part of what, a major part of what led to Martin Luther's rebellion and the starting of the, the Protestant Reformation. Is that when the in idea of the indulgences started? Well, a little while before that. They were trying to raise money to build the St. Peter's Cathedral yeah. in, in but Rome. Is that, is that when it's as far as I know, first started? As far as I know, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but since Jesus died almost 2,000 years ago, and we are still committing sins today, and we believe that he died for our sins, is that in effect Jesus buying indulgences for our sins? Well, I don't think forgiveness is the only issue. If it was, God could have forgiven Adam and Eve or even Satan if it was they just They were forgiven. They're all, everybody yeah. is forgiven. That's the way yeah, God well, that's is. that's what he's saying. Forgiveness is not... It that's isn't the, the issue. Only, yeah. That's not the, the problem, you know. We forgive our children, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, so, uh, and other people. So there's more to salvation than just being forgiven. We are born dead. You're so departing way away from Protestant theology when you say that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so salvation means healing. Yeah. It does. And what, what needs healing? If I had pancreatic cancer, is that what needs healing? Or is it the way I think about God, which affects the way I approach everything in life? Yeah. Right. Well, there's plenty of evidence in Scripture that we can't earn salvation by any kind of, our, of human behavior by ourselves. Salvation comes only through faith in a personal Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, in effect, becomes our, and here's the other word that they discuss in some detail, our substitute. Now, how does the substitution, how does substitution really work? What's being substituted for what? In the larger setting of the great controversy, here's one possibility, the life and death of Jesus proved the falseness of the accusations and claims of Satan. By understanding the accusations and claims of Satan and then accepting and believing the answers which God has provided, we realize the truth and by faith develop an ever-increasing trust faith in God. We love him and daily seek to know more about his character and government. And thus, by beholding him through the power of the Holy Spirit, we become changed into his image. Instead of sinking down ever deeper into sin, we can rise to immortal life. Thus, our salvation takes the place of our condemnation and destruction. Now, is that substitution? Well, you're, you're saying that, that 
it proves Satan wrong, mm -hmm. what was Satan trying to say? I mean, what is it that he was saying? He was a whole, saying a whole lot of things, but basically it meant that he tried, he tried to claim that if he were in charge, things would be better off than having God in charge. He would run a better government. That's, that's the bottom line. Genesis 3, God is lying. Yeah. Well, 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 how does that explain that being wrong? I know that it's wrong, but how, do, how does the actions that Jesus did explain it to be wrong? Well, uh, there's several things. Satan had claimed back after Adam and Eve sinned, he said, okay, there, no human being... All human beings will choose my side against God. No human being will ever be able to live a perfect, sinless life. So the first thing Jesus did is he lived a perfect, sinless life as a human being and proved Satan was wrong. And there's a whole list of things. Satan had claimed right there in Genesis 3, right up front, God, well, Genesis 2, God says, sin is deadly. And Satan in Genesis 3 said, oh, no, it's not. So... On the, on the cross, Satan dies of sin, Jesus. what we call the second, I'm sorry, Jesus dies of sin, the second death. And the universe, watched, no human being at that point in time realized what was going on. But the universe watching, they knew, they could see that Jesus was dying the second death, separation from his father. He cried out, my God, my God, not why are you torturing me, why are you punishing me, you know, why are you doing whatever, why have you abandoned me? So, so if, if, you, if we separate ourselves from God, we die. Satan said, oh, no, no, you can live on just fine separated from God. Well, Jesus proved that you can. And then a third thing that Jesus did, if we're going to just mention that very briefly, on Sunday morning, Satan and all of his angels said they had not been able to get Jesus to sin. They hadn't been able to get him to give up. They hadn't been able to make it so difficult for him that he just gave up and went back to heaven. So they said, okay, now that he's dead, he's ours, we will keep him in the grave. They couldn't do it. He rose on his own power, his own divinity, and went back to heaven, proving that he was God, and Satan is not God. And he knows perfectly well that if he dies, there's no way he's, he's going to be able to rise again. So there's just three very simple things, that, that really important things that Jesus proved by his life, proved that Satan was lying. It's a start. Okay. So there's, good, there's going to be a point when we're all going to be living perfectly like Jesus did. Yeah, when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And then we'll all be doing that, which will be God contradicting can, what Satan said. Well, God cannot... Even if he wanted to, he cannot allow people into heaven that'll just start the great controversy all over again. He just can't do it. I mean, what would be the point? I mean, we've been through this once. We don't need to do it again. It all comes down to the will. Um, mm -hmm. The basic Luther Luciferian doctrine is do thine own will. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it takes many different forms. Uh, yeah. At the end of uh, the Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis said there will only be two pe kinds of people left at the end, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, another issue that's related to this, and we, we don't have time to discuss any of these things in depth, is there's a lot of people who believe that somehow or other, God, because of what Jesus did here on this earth, is going to do something in the books of heaven. And everything depends on what those books in heaven say. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with the books in heaven. And Peter makes it pretty clear that he doesn't believe that. Uh, if God could safely, and, and my, my argument would be, if God could safely remove our sins and turn us into saints without our consent or participation, he surely would have done so long ago. I mean, we've already talked about Adam and Eve. Why couldn't God just remove their sins and, and, and leave them as saints in the garden? He should have done it even before that. He should have done it with Lucifer, if, if God can do that. But, you know, God doesn't... I mean, we know that God wants to save everybody, but he will not violate our freedom by doing that. We were all robots. He, he could. Mm. He could just yeah. take us down and... 
reprogram mm -hmm. us and, yep. and everything. There's no love there when you do yeah. that, though. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's the, the key. If God is love, you can only create intelligent creatures that have the capacity to make a choice. Yeah. Well, one of the things that was clearly shown, even though it seemed to have lose, lost its impact after a while, by the Old Testament sacrificial system, is that sin leads to death. Now, it's not death of you, it's death of a lamb, but the, uh, that was supposed to be repulsive. It was supposed to be so obnoxious, so revolting, when they had to actually kill a lamb, uh, that they, they said, well, I, we need to stop sinning. Well, of course, we know that they got to a place where they had killed so many lambs, it just, oh, another lamb? <laughs> so what? And... Uh, did they have any idea what they were doing, what the purpose of it was, though? We've discussed that a few minutes mm -hmm. ago, but really, uh, it's a pure, sound like a purely pagan concept when you do something to pay for sins or to yeah. change God's mind. Well, you can't change God's mind. Yeah. We can change our mind, but God can't change ours, and, and uh, we can't change His. Um, well... If God's trying to teach us how deadly sin is, what would be the point of that? Right. It makes no sense. Well, I mean, if, 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 if it makes no sense to keep sinning. Right, but yeah. we're, we're assuming that yeah. sinning is rational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. <laughs> There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are yeah. the ways of death. Do you need to be taught anymore how bad sin is? Well, it's well, not just you, about we shouldn't bad, need to, but yeah, it's not just about how bad sin is. It's about how good God is. So if we knew that's, that's where the life comes from. Well, it's also how about how bad sin is. I mean, if you know how bad sin is, Gary, does that mean you've stopped sinning? Well, that's what I was wondering. If <laughs> if you know how bad it is, will you stop sinning? Well, here's here's some suggested ideas about what, what they should have learned from the Old Testament sacrificial system. God is supposed to be the center of our lives just as the tabernacle was at the center of the Israelite encampment. That's, I think that's a good lesson. Two, everything connected with God and the worship of God is holy. It needs to be clean, it needs to be pure, and it needs to be separate from sin. Three, Everything, uh, our only hope of salvation is in going to God and asking for His help and making the necessary changes in our lives. And I'm, you know that all the process they went through to accomplish that, and I'm not, I don't have time to discuss those. Four, while we may not understand all that is involved, and the Israelites obviously did not, God will take care of things if we do our part by taking the time and making the effort to bring God into the center of our lives. Five, sin leads to death. Six, if we, w if we do not want to die of sin, we need to accept God's plan of salvation. And seven, when we recognize the cost and seriousness of sin, we will ask for God's help and rid ridding our lives of this deadly taint. I think those are the lessons that they should have, everybody should have been able to get from the Old Testament system. Do we get those from the writings of Moses, the writings of the whole Bible, the writings of Ellen White, or even subsequently? Where I, did you get those? What? Where did you get those? From the Bible. From the Does it say that completely like that, or did you have to... Well, not in those words. Those well, words I don't are, know if you're interpreting things right. I'm just telling you, you to, I put down my ideas here, and now you're going you're gonna to shoot me down. No, no, I'm not trying to shoot you down, but there might be some other things. Good. Do. Think about it. If you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Well, I told you my suggestions. It would twist some things around. You wouldn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if they're valid suggestions, we should talk about them. Well, there's one thing I think we can say absolutely for certain, and I certainly hope nobody's going to disagree with me on this one. God's gracious forgiveness was never intended to eliminate or wipe out our past record of sins just so we can go out and do them all over again. Well, why wouldn't we do them all over again? We wouldn't do them over again because we know they're wrong. 
right? So th the point well, of then, the then what's your point there? Well, it's not just about knowledge, though. Correct mm -hmm. knowledge doesn't produce correct behavior. I mean, you as a physician uh, tell people uh, correct stuff all the time, and they may even assent to it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they follow through on it. Uh, there's, it it's really comes down to what spirit we are of. What what forces are driving our actions? Where where do we look for uh, guidance and such? So, well, it, Peter draws his conclusions straight out of Leviticus, right here in the middle of his discussion. If you look at First Peter one verses fifteen and sixteen, he says, "Instead of living your worthless lives in with times where you're ignorant, instead be holy in all that you do, just as God who called you is holy." The scripture says, be holy because I am holy. So he's saying, however you look at all that kind of stuff, God's ultimate goal is to get you to be holy. Isn't that a fair challenge? And holy means what? Set, set apart for, for, for holy purposes, for honorable, God-fearing purposes. And as we behold Christ, through the Spirit, we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. So to be holy is to have God at the center of your life. Yes. Right. In reality, yeah. Now you just, already said that. Yeah, that's, that's where I got from. And, and here again, in, in chapter 3, verse 11, it says, They must turn away from evil and do good. They must strive for peace with all their hearts. So that's... He doesn't think that there's a, this is not a, you know, well, maybe I'd like to do that, but it's too, too difficult. No, he's saying it's necessary. Well, um, there's a bunch of verses here. I don't, we've already read some of them. Um, and, and Peter, as you, as you remember what we've studied, how do these first and second Peter, especially first Peter, how does it relate to the ideas of substitution? If we're sinners and then God calls us to be holy, then something needs to happen, right? It will give us adequate evidence on which to make a decision, mm -hmm. for or against. Yeah? Okay. Well, remember that Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 8, Happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. So does that mean if you're not pure in heart, you won't see God? You can't see God. Sort of sounds like that, doesn't it? Natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit for their foolishness to him. And Peter talks quite a lot about God's judgment. Um, we're, notice that we are judged savable by God not only because we are justified or forgiven, but also because our actions are actually changed. And he talks about God will judge us by what we have done. So if Peter expects us to live holy lives, um, what does it mean to live a holy life? Whether, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. Okay. And you stole that from Paul. <laughs> Well, can, we think, can you think of something in the Bible, a very common thing that was set apart to be holy? Sabbath. The Sabbath is an obvious example. So what does it mean to be set apart to be holy? We, we call that process sanctification. Is the, is the Sabbath sanctified? That's what Genesis says. Mm -hmm. He rested and made it holy. And the commandment. Uh, Sabbath commandment says that. Okay. So we become holy by not working on that day? Well, that's just a part of what we... Well, we're supposed uh, to worship God on that day. We're supposed to get to know Him better on that day. We're supposed to spread the gospel to our neighbors and friends on that day. A whole lot of things we're supposed to do. But aren't we supposed to do that every day? If yeah. We, if you keep the first commandment? But six days you're supposed to labor. But yeah, that's what days. I was saying. So that day you don't work. Yeah. So that's the only that difference. Day is, that day is a special day. You, you might do a little bit of it during the week, 
in your spare time, but Sabbath is supposed to be set apart to be special. Sabbath is because the day we don't you work. spend with your family. It's the day when you spend with your family of God. Mm. The rest of the week, you're with your family, but you're working. You're consumed with other activities. Sabbath is the day that you you get your whole group together. And it and gives him honor, glory yeah. to to change what we do on that day because it's his. P Peter, Peter gets down. He gets pretty specific. He says, "We must rid ourselves of malice, guile." insincerity, envy, and slander, 1 Peter 2, 1. Then he goes on, he says, we must learn how to live in, in unity of spirit with other mem church members. We must learn to love other members, and we must be humble, 1 Peter 3, 8, and 9. In his latter that we've talked about, Peter taught that Christians should also have goodness, godliness, and love. And finally, we, to, we are to cast our anxiety upon Jesus, 1 Peter 5, 7. Our goal, in other words, is to be Christ-like. The only way to accomplish that is to be constantly focused on His life so that the Holy Spirit can transform us to become more like Him. By the way, let me ask you this question. When do you think that process will end? Does it end when we get to heaven? I, th I think we continue to grow to know Him. Uh, we continue to... The more we know Him, the more we have to give. Mm -hmm others because that's really what mm -hmm. the reward is about is our capacity to give which is dependent on our capacity sure. to know and receive from the giver mm -hmm. of all good gifts so uh, and that's really what the work uh, uh, the work uh, <coughs> judgment is about is, is about Peter Peter goes on to gift. say that God's judgment will come before the reward before the second coming as he understood it uh, and then he spelled out what would happen to the wicked. However, Peter recognized that this message would not be received readily by all. Skeptics and scoffers will deny God's very existence and his ability to intervene in the events on this earth. But ultimately, evil will be totally destroyed. Okay? Peter recognized that some, perhaps many, of his initial readers would suffer one or more kinds of discrimination, even persecution. But he reminded them that Jesus had proven that even death in this world is not the end. In other words, even if one is killed, his future reward awaits and is an eternal life with God in heaven. So you can see, if, if, if someone could say, you know, if you say, okay, the only thing that you, you have is this life on this earth, and someone threatens your life, it's basically all over, right? But if someone says to you, even if you die, God has a plan for you for the rest of eternity, you don't have to worry about someone killing you. I mean, not nearly so much anyway. Well, then he went on to say that the wicked and the godless will be destroyed in a worldwide firestorm. 2 Peter 3, 7. Maybe I should just read those verses, uh, that verse. But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. I want to make that a little bit larger here. Okay. Well, we're from bad to worse here. Sorry. Okay, Peter recognized that all Christians who are serious about their religion are hoping that the second coming of Jesus will be soon. And I always, I always have to chuckle in my own mind when I, when I read something like that because they once did a study on Christians in general and said, when do you think Jesus will come? And the average was about five years after I die. <laughs> Everybody, everybody seemed to wonder, well, let me live my life here and enjoy everything here in this world. And, and yeah, okay, then it's okay for you to come. Why are all those things being preserved for fire? Well, you mean, why is all evil and wickedness no, being preserved for... about the earth and, and the things... Well, 
I think it's, it's because that's where, that's where, that's the one blot in the universe where sin and evil exist. And God says we have to get rid of that and start over. So mine it's says, contaminated? Mine says being reserved for fire. Mm -hmm. Preserved or reserved. Yeah. It's not uh, yeah. uh, in mothballs or mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's being reserved for so fire. For de it's destined for destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another way to put it. So, the Bible talks about delay, and Peter talks about delay, and he says, because of delay, the skeptics and scoffers are saying, hey, things are just the same as they always have been. Where do you get this crazy notion that God is going to bring things to an end sometime? And what is his response to that? What, what is his answer? How does, why is God delaying? Because he doesn't want anybody to be lost. Okay. But all, all to come. Now that's that's a that's a that's a challenging idea because as long as new babies keep being born, won't there always be new people to be saved? Well, How does that work? That's an assumption that we generally think. Um, think the day is going to come when every baby who is born will be evil. Let's, let's hope maybe, not. Maybe, maybe. Well, I'm not going to say. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a tough one. There's I some some ideas if you throw out there, people are going to uh, get the wrong idea. So. Uh -huh. Well, P Peter goes on and talks about in Second First Peter two eleven to twenty one and chapter five, one to five that there must be order in government and in the church. If you want to accomplish anything, you need to be organized and you need to be orderly. He challenges his readers, just as Paul did in Romans 13, to respect the government. You're supposed to be good citizens. You're supposed to live good lives. Don't so so you know if you're if you're being persecuted, if you're being tormented, let let it not be because you're you're doing evil, and you deserve it. Let it be because you're doing good, and they're still persecuting you. So. Um, we recognize that there have been times down through history when certain governments have been truly evil. Uh, it's a little hard to find anything good in, in Nazism, or maybe in the government of Stalin in Russia after that. However, it is generally true that good governments serve the purposes of God by preserving law and order and safety in society. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do, right? So do you think Peter and Paul agree more or less in the necessity of good government, both without and within the church? Paul says so in, in Romans, when you get into, towards the end of the book there, uh, submitting to authorities and... Uh, That's the first 10 verses of Romans 13. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it kind of sounds like he just didn't want any excuse for them, valid excuse for them to come after Christians. Mm -hmm. Fair Just enough. Make it be completely servant, subservient to the laws, and do everything that they tell you as far as possible, so long as the government doesn't, you know, contradict your loyalty to God. And if they do, can still come after you. That mm -hmm. tells you what's kind of what's going on. Well, but re Peter recognizes at the same time that if you do good, it's not because you are inherently good. Any good that we have. We don't. There's nothing we can boast about. That good comes from our, from God working in us and through us. Um, when the rich young ruler, I think it was, mm -hmm. the trans, said, called him good teacher, mm -hmm. he said, uh, "Why do you call me good? Only God is good." Uh, again, re reaffirming what you just said. And just a thought for you people out there, which we won't have time to discuss right now. You think most of the governments around the world think about what's going on in the news? Most of the governments in the world are serving God's purposes? Even the government within churches, within our church, within the Catholic Church, those are the main Christian churches that we know about, and Baptists and Methodists and so forth. Are those governments serving the interests of God fully and completely? Well, fully and completely some kind of perfection, which I don't think okay. we're going to see in any kind of organization. 
uh, made up uh, of fallen human beings. I would say that if, if, we, if any church had fully and completely obeyed God, we would all be in the kingdom. Right. But yeah. the potential exists. There, there are channels for things to be organized through, as opposed to just you know people showing up and randomly doing stuff. Uh, that's more akin to evolutionary thought than than it is to how God does things and, yeah. and how love works. Well, here's some there's interesting. There's a sense in which even dictators protect Christians and freedom of religion. Saddam Hussein is said to have protected uh, the freedom of religion in Iraq before. Assad's been doing the same thing in Syria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look, look, to some extent. well, yeah. So, yeah. Well, but compared to what what the alternative is compared the most to likely chaos. to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what? How many Christians have been driven out of Iraq? Yeah, you know. Yeah. I have a number, not a number, but several friends who. Their families came, it, either they themselves came from or their families came from Iraq, basically had to leave. So, then he talks about the prophets of the Old Testament, Peter. It was concerning this salvation that the prophet, this is First Peter 1, starting with verse 10. It was concerning this salvation that the prophets made careful search and investigation, and they prophesied about this gift which God would give you. They tried to find out when the time would be and how it would come. This was the time to which Christ's spirit in them was pointing and predicting the sufferings that Christ would have, to endure, would have to endure and the glory that would follow. God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours. Think about the implications of that. Prophets way back in the Old Testament times did something that was for the benefit of people in Peter's day and presumably for the benefit of us in our day as they going on as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit and sent sent from heaven he's basically now talking about and you heard about these things from the apostles that have come around from time to time and told you about it and then a very interesting sentence these are things which even the angels would like to understand Another, what was he talking about there? Another interesting wrinkle on that is that the historical critical method, one of the tenets is that you can't read out of the text what the person wouldn't have understood at the time. Mm. There has to be some kind of local application. And yet Peter is contradicting that, saying it, it wasn't for them, it was for down the road. And that was very clear in Daniel 8 and 9, wasn't it? Daniel says, I can't understand this. It made me sick. It wasn't for quite a long time before God revealed a little more hint about what it was all about. Well, <clears throat> in order to best understand these messages, we need to study them together with the writings of the Holy Prophets of the Old Testament. Where, uh, and they were being joined, at that point in Peter's day, being joined by messages from the apostles, which would eventually form the New Testament. However, Peter recognized that while pe people like Paul wrote serious and challenging messages, there will always be people who want to twist and misconstrue them to their own destruction. But we'd see, we need to recognize that those words, understood correctly, are the words of God. Where would we be without the teachings of the Old and New Testaments? I would say we're especially indebted to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who recorded their various versions of the story of Jesus, who was God <coughs> himself. We need to recognize that our only hope of salvation is an understanding of the Word of God as presented in Scripture. We must read it prayerfully and carefully in the context, first of all, of the local passage, the local chapter, in the context of the book and what time was he writing? To whom was he writing? Why was he writing? As far as we can understand it. And then in context of the entire scripture, what's the whole, what's the basic theme of scriptures? The great controversy, for example. How does that impact our understanding of this? And then finally, in, in the light of all of uh, salvific or, or salvation history. So, um, we need to ask ourselves how these lessons from long ago can apply to our own lives today. 
What is it that God wants to teach us? Are we willing to surrender our pet theories to the truths as presented in the Bible with the help of the Spirit of Prophecy, the writings of Ellen White? Well, Peter says we need to learn a lot, a lot of things through Jesus, through the Scriptures, and learn to live holy and godly lives. In speaking to the General Conference session in April of 1891, Ellen White said, Brethren, will you... She had just come back from Australia. I'm sorry, no, she was just getting ready to go to Australia, more or less against her best wisdom, but she said, The brethren have asked me to go. I haven't had any word from God, but I'm on my way. She says, Brethren, will you... They had come to the General Conference session. Brethren, will you carry the Spirit of Christ with you as you return to your homes and churches? Will you put away unbelief and criticism? We are coming to a time when, unbel uh, uh, time when more than ever before we shall need to press together to labor unitedly. In union there is strength, in discord and disunion there is only weakness. I was, uh, spoke on April 13, 1891. Well, 2 Peter 3.12 contains one of the challenging ideas which has stirred a lot of controversy down through the ages. Let's look at that. 2 Peter 3.12 As you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon, the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. Okay, now we could discuss how the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat, but the more challenging idea is the Bible talks about delay and Peter talks about hastening. If God knows everything, and he knows, he must know exactly when he, he's going to come back again, how could there be hastening or, or delay? Well, when you work to hasten something, that means you're working positive towards it. Okay. If you're working to delay it, that means you're working negatively towards it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter um, what God knows. It's going to be like that all the time. So yeah. God's plan may have been to come in 1844, 1845, but he knew that wasn't going to happen. So mm -hmm. it's a delay from what he wanted to do. Maybe he wanted to come in AD 50. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wanted to come just a year after the, resur after the resurrection. Maybe he wanted to come back at the time of Adam. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wanted to come back any second of the of the time. Yeah. So whenever every the second. thing the thing is, whatever his plan is, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to be shut down or something yeah. going to go wrong with it. Yeah. Well, if we could see everything as God sees it, then maybe we could come up with a definitive answer. But yeah. we're going to have to trust him with that. And we, mm -hmm. I think he wants us to be task-oriented, not time-oriented. Yeah. Not, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? You know, that kind of... You, you sound like someone who's had kids traveling. <laughs> <laughs> just around the next time. Yeah. But yet but, there is a time that he's going to come, and he knows yeah. it. Yeah. And he's the only one that knows it. Yeah. Right. Well, serious Christians believe... Uh, that nature is God's second book. Paul talks about that, Romans 2, and so forth. Unfortunately, we know that modern-day skeptics, evolutionists, and some scientists have interpreted things they see and understand from nature in ways to do their best to eliminate God from the picture. It is clear that the writing, or is it clear that the writings of the Bible clearly and simply apply to our understanding of nature? Well, not so easily. If properly understood, God's two books are in full agreement, we would say. But that agreement can get essentially destroyed when one book is set aside while trying to understand the other. Christians should never allow that to happen. We need to recognize that for evolutionists and atheists, their beliefs are their religion. They want us to believe that they have science and we have religion. But we should never yield that point or allow them to convince us of that position. They have their religion. We have our religion. If they want to compare religions, that's fine. Let's compare religion with religion. They have, they have their scientific facts. We have the same scientific facts. Our interpretations are different, but the facts are the same. So, what have we learned from our study of First and Second Peter? 
we in the last couple of minutes. Well, and, and does our does your understanding of First and Second Peter agree with what you've learned from the rest of the Bible? Anybody find something in Peter that's just doesn't fit? It's interesting to notice that Martin Luther, when he was writing his first, doing his first translation of the New Testament from Greek into German, was very comfortable with First Peter. He saw the Christomonistic principle there in First Peter, but he didn't know what to do with Second Peter. Why do you think that was? Too much about works and judgment. Yeah, and about second coming and predicting the f f future events and so on. Although Martin Luther seemed to think that the second coming was going to be about 300 years after he was dead. Well, God has a long-term, in fact, eternal plan for every one of his children. We are the only ones, we ourselves personally are the only ones that can, by our exercising our freedom, disqualify ourselves from being a part of that plan. In light of God's future judgment, we are called to live holy and godly lives. Um, there's nothing that we are required to do, that we are required to have or understand that God hasn't provided. Um, God's method of preparing us for eternal salvation is the life and death of Jesus and the rest of scriptures. God says, study it learn about it, think about it, meditate on it every day. And if you do that, the Holy Spirit will enter your life and gradually transform you to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And that is the plan of salvation. Peter talks about a price that was supposed to be paid, and we would like to leave you with some questions to think about. And if you, if you want to get our handout, uh, it's available on theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, Think about if there's a price to be paid, who paid that price? And to whom was it paid? And what was the price? Uh, it was the Father demanding that something be paid to him? Was the devil demanding that something be paid in order to get sinners back? That's something that would be good for you to discuss in your Sabbath school class. Um, the death of Jesus will be the same death that the wicked will die in the end, it says in Desire of Ages 753. So think about that in terms of the judgment, in terms of what Peter was talking about in these books. A kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to have these books with so many challenging ideas and so much truth for us to consider. Be with us as we continue to study your word as presented to the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, and may we clearly understand the role you want us to play in our day so that that coming may indeed be soon, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.